Good evening, everybody. Uh, hope you're ready for a Bible class. Let's have one. What do you say? Turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And uh, we've been somewhere in the middle of this and all around it for uh, several weeks now. Took a little bit of a side road last week and uh, to accommodate me sitting at home doing the class. And, and so we're going back into Acts chapter 20 here tonight. And we're going to consider some things that Paul uh, had done, was doing, and is yet going to do. And the pivotal spot is right here in Acts chapter 20. He says, it says of Paul in, um, in verse um, 3 of Acts chapter 20, it says that he, Paul, there abode three months. Now he's in... Um, Greece, but it appears to not be Achaia, but rather higher up into Greece. Uh, he, de he departed for to go into Macedonia in verse 1, and when he'd gone over Macedonia, those parts, it says, he came into Greece. Well, Macedonia and Greece today are all one deal there, but it would be, he, when he came into Greece, he'd be north of Athens. Now, I don't know why. He was there, but that's where he was. And notice that um, he, didn't, he didn't then stay in Greece. Look at verse, uh, uh, he stayed there three months, verse 3, that he abode there three months, and when the Jews laid wait for him as he was about to sail into Syria. Well, that's a long ways. In other words, he's in Greece, and he's going to go all the way around Turkey, if you will, to go into Syria. That's his plan. He purposed to return through Macedonia, which is reversed. In other words, if he's like right here and he was going to go to Syria, he'd go this way. But he purposed to go through Macedonia, so here he was in Greece and he went back north to go through Macedonia. Now, that's what's fascinating here because what he does next, you see, it says again, as he was about to sail into Syria, the middle of verse three, he purposed to return through Macedonia. Now watch this next couple of verses. And there accompanied him into Asia, which means he was going to into Macedonia and then go east into Asia. And evidently in order to get back toward Jerusalem, that's his ultimate plan here. I'll get back to that part in a moment. And there accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus. These going before tarried for us at Troas. Now, if you'll remember way back in Acts chapter um, 16, he went up the Galatian coast into Troas before going over into Europe. Now, watch the next verse. And we sailed away from Philippi, after the days of unleavened bread. I don't know exactly when that was. The days of unleavened bread in all three cases is uh, eight days. It's a, it's a starting Sabbath, and it goes through to the beginning Sabbath again. So it's like a seven-day week plus one. It's an eight-day um, uh, days of unleavened bread. So he, he carried in Philippi um, at least that long. Now, if you jump forward through all of the time frame of him going into jail, he goes into Jerusalem, uh, two or three visits, he goes into Jerusalem, uh, trouble with people, goes through three different court systems, and finally winds up in prison in Acts chapter 28, and uh, he, he, he is there in prison in Acts chapter 28 for two years. So if I come over here and I say, this is Acts chapter 28, if I back up over here to Acts chapter 20, the verses we just read, I probably could put together somewhere between four and five years. Some people might argue about that, but they wouldn't argue much. In other words, it could be three to four years, or it might be four to five years. My guess is four to five years. I'm guessing then that he went into prison in about A.D. 65 and that he 
In Acts chapter 20, then, would be AD, about A.D. 60 or 61. You add that up ever how the way you want to. It doesn't matter to me. But the reason I make the point is that the last place he went in Europe was the first place he went in Europe. Look back in Acts 16. Verse 11, therefore loosing from Troas, in chapter 20, it says they, they, uh, they, they were going to meet people in, they, they turned for them at Troas. He's going back to Troas. Now notice in chapter 16, therefore loosing, verse 11, therefore loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia and the next day to Neapolis and from thence to Philippi which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia. Now, that's his first visit to Europe. That's his first visit to Philippi. But now look over, back over in chapter 20, verse 5. All these guys listed there in verse 4 are going to tarry for Paul and Luke, evidently, he said, for us, uh, at Troas. Now watch. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days where we abode seven days. So here's the deal. To go from Philippi to Troas took five days, and Philippi was the last European city he visited, just like it was the first European city that he visited. I know he went through those others, but he was looking for that chief city of Macedonia, Philippi, which was a colony. Now, my point is that Philippi is on both ends of several years of journey in the general area. Acts 16, they went to Philippi. Acts 20, they come back through Philippi and on the, to go back to Jerusalem. They go to Syria and then Jerusalem. So here's the deal. Acts chapter 11, Paul preached one year at Antioch in Syria uh, to the Grecians and all who gathered there. In Acts chapter 13, he preached the gospel of Christ in the other Antioch, in Pisidia, and around about and started Galatian churches, all of which is about 10 or 11 churches. Then he went to Philippi. Well, he'd been preaching there between Acts chapter 11 and the 13, 14 era. Uh, he'd been preaching there about 12 years before he went to Philippi, right? So that wasn't, you wouldn't call, he, he's a pretty seasoned preacher, preaching the gospel of Christ for about a dozen years before he got to Philippi. Now look, if you will, in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Now, I suspect that when I read this, Somebody's going to say, oh, I don't know what that means. I'm, this is hard to understand. This is too complicated. This isn't complicated at all. These are sixth grade words, simple narrative, not complicated. The problem is we sometimes don't want to believe what we read. But Philippi is where he went in Acts 16 when he left Asia and went into Europe. And Philippi is where he left when he went back uh, through Asia to go back to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 20. Now notice, um, verse, um, start with me in verse 10. Uh, uh, did I say Philippians chapter 4? Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last... Your care of me hath flourished again. Well, that sounds like it would be, since he didn't write this until he went into prison, it sounds like the at the last would be in Acts chapter 20, right? Okay. Um, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, you have done well, I'm sorry, you have well done, 
that you did communicate with my affliction. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. In Acts chapter 16, he wasn't departing from Macedonia. He was going into Macedonia. In Acts chapter 20, he went to Macedonia in order to depart and go back to the east, go back toward Jerusalem. Just read that verse 15 again. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Well, I don't believe this is Acts chapter 16. That wasn't the beginning of the gospel. That was about a dozen years after he had started preaching the gospel in about 10 or 11 other places. And he wasn't departing from Macedonia in Acts chapter 16. That's when he got there, first time. But this says, in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia. You see, nobody that looks at Paul's later epistles as being uniquely different has any trouble with this. But if you think that he's preached the exact same thing from day one of Acts chapter 9 all the way through the writing of all 13 epistles and all the way through the book of Acts, then you'll have problems with this. You just have to consider what the words say. When was the beginning of the gospel? Now, if you say it's Acts 9 or Acts 11 or Acts 13, I will agree with you that's the beginning of the gospel of Christ. But he couldn't be talking about the, the Philippians at that time. And when he did get to Philippi, he had been preaching for 12 years. So the beginning of the gospel, when he departed from Macedonia, there really isn't much question about that. That's Acts chapter 20. And see, I told you, there's things in Acts chapter 20 people don't pay any attention to. And there is a lot of them, a lot of the things. So now we've got this, we've got this dangling uh, thing out there about Philippi. So just let it dangle. Go back to Acts chapter 20 now. You know, if I had uh, any, any uh, power at all, I could pull a shade down over that sun out there. That's getting littler, though. It won't be but a minute or two. All right, now, in Acts chapter 20, Paul and these men who are with him of verse 4, they sailed away from Philippi in verse 6. Now, here's what they're going to do. So here's, here comes Acts chapter 20, and he's going to go, he's going to have a long speech with the elders of Ephesus. And they're going to they're going to weep over him, and he and they sorrow because they don't believe they're going to get to see him anymore. And he leaves. Then you go into twenty one, and people try to get him to they try to stop Paul from going to Jerusalem. Now, I don't know if, if you've ever heard this. Any of you have ever heard this? But there are people who believe that Paul should not have gone to Jerusalem. And they believe that he went totally out of the will of God when he went to Jerusalem. And when we get further into this chapter, I hope to show you, and at 21, I hope to show you that's not true. Paul was never upbraided nor rebuked for going to Jerusalem. He did exactly what the Lord had called him to do by going to Jerusalem. And the Lord assured him to be of good cheer. Now, so he gets there to Jerusalem, and sure enough, by the end of chapter 22, he's in a, he's in a prison of some sort. And then 23, he stands in front of a, a magistrate, a judge. In 24, 25, and 26, it's the king's 
that the prophecy said that he was going to stand in front of, bear my name, Jesus said, bear my name before uh, uh, Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And so there he's going to do that right there in those chapters. In fact, he's going to rebuke the Jews and uh, he's going to uh, uh, have to be forced to do a thing that means that a Gentile king who wanted to let him go can't let him go. So nevertheless, that's what's going to take place right there. In 27 and the first part of 28, down to about, I think it's down to about verse 15, it's a shipwreck. If a shipwreck don't kill you, you know, the devil ain't trying hard enough, right? But nevertheless, that's what takes place. Now, starting where we're at, this, has got, this is going to cover years. I believe that this is about four years, something like that, to get to Acts chapter 28 and to get into prison, somewhere between four and five years. Now, if you don't believe that, that's all right. It won't make me angry because you don't believe that. But nevertheless, if you unfold the book of Acts and you can't take care to watch what you're reading in the days and months and weeks and time, all, all that sort of thing that adds up and the number of feast days and all that sort of thing that are going on, then you can put about that many years together. Now, what happened, though, is he wrote something in Acts chapter 20 back here that said, he wrote, he wrote it in Acts chapter 20, that said he was going to Rome. Look in Romans chapter 15. In Romans 15, He says in, of, of the location that he's been doing, the things he's been doing, it says uh, in verse 18, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by uh, word and deed. And that goes from uh, his start of his ministry back here right up through until he's writing the book of Romans right here in Acts chapter 20. All of this time is what he's talking about, making the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. And uh, uh, the, by the way, he's not trying to make them obedient to the law. He's not trying to make them obedient to him. He's trying to get them to be obedient to the gospel of Christ. You'll see that. Uh, notice verse 19. Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so if I strive to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. He's writing here, and he's talking about going to Rome. Verse 23. But now having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire to the, these many years to come unto you. Now watch. Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you. For I trust to see you in my journey, and to be brought on my way thitherward by you. If first I might be, I may be, uh, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, for it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia, to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem, from uh, uh, Corinth all the way up to Philippi and across to Troas and on and on and on, he's gathered this, this contribution. Verse 27, It has pleased them verily, and their debtors they are, for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of theirs, Israel, Jerusalem's spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed them, to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. He never got to Spain. He did, however, get to Rome as a prisoner. He did not get to Rome in the same manner that he believed he was going to go there. But he did get there. And so, you know, opinions being what they are, arise about the mm, 
the um, uh, wisdom of Paul getting to Rome in the manner in which he did. We're going to be talking about this for more than one week. So let's just go back to Acts chapter 20 now and think about this long journey. It's going to take him from Troas or Philippi, actually. It's going to take him to Rome. You know, if he'd have just turned west there, he could have been there in no time. But he had this gift he had to take back to Jerusalem. Now you understand, that was his job. Notice his job. Go to hold on to Acts chapter 20 and go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2. It's the time, uh, it's Paul telling of the time when he was, when he told, went to Jerusalem and told the apostles the gospel he was preaching. And it has everything to do with the, there being two different gospels. You know, there's another, if it, if it ain't one thing, it's 43 more. There's another brush up today on Facebook about whether or not people from every, all of the time in the Bible, whether or not they're saved the same way. Now, the men who have put together a program, I think it's four of them, maybe it's either four or five preachers, and they're going to preach on, all day long, they're going to preach on salvation has always been the same. At least, at least, all of them but one is going to be wrong. <laughs> and maybe all of them will be wrong. If no one disagrees with them and teaches what salvation by grace through faith really means, then they're all going to be wrong about their premise that salvation has always been the same. No, it hasn't always been the same. As a matter of fact, salvation is different several different times in the Bible. And when someone doesn't think that's true, their problem is they don't want to think of it the way the Bible wrote it. They're trying to think of it in a manner which it would be comfortable for everyone. That is no way to look at Scripture. In fact, that's a very horrible way to look at Scripture. So, those things crop up from time to time, and most of the time, we don't do anything about them because we got no business fooling with them. So, here's the deal. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul describes two different Gospels to two different leaders for two different purposes and two different groups of people. Galatians chapter 2, verse 6. But of these who seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, those would be non-Jews, Gentiles, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision, that would be Jews, was unto Peter. In other words, there was a gospel of, not two, there's a gospel of the uncircumcision, and there's a gospel of, not two, there's a gospel of the circumcision. Well, uncircumcision and circumcision are opposite things. If there was a gospel of one and there was a gospel of another and they're not the same thing, then how in the world are you going to make them the same just because you want the words of the gospel to be the same when you can't find the words of the gospel of the uncircumcision wound up being the same as the words of the gospel of the circumcision, and you can't find the words of the gospel of the circumcision wind up being the same as the words of the gospel of the uncircumcision. What in the world is wrong with just letting things that are different be different? You don't even have to get angry about it. Nobody has to be angry about that. Just let it go. Let it be whatever it is. You know why? Ain't nothing you can do about it anyway. It's already written down. <clears throat> Notice verse 8. 
and please notice, it is a parenthesis, which is that at most, it is important enough to draw your attention to it. At the least, grammatically, it is something that could have been left out, but is put there for a further explanation of what goes before and what goes afterwards. So let's read it the way it should be read. Verse 7. For he that wrought effectually in Peter. Who was that? Oh, yeah, that was the Lord Jesus Christ. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Jesus Christ is the foundation, whether it's Peter's gospel or whether it's Paul's gospel. But that doesn't make Peter's gospel and Paul's gospel the same gospel. Verse 7 showed they were different. So does verse 9. Look, look at verse 9. And when James, Cephas, that's Peter, and when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Now, folks, listen to me. Don't miss this. The right hand of fellowship was because of the perception of the grace that was given to Paul and Barnabas. There was no right hand of fellowship because Paul saw what they had. It's because they saw what Paul had. But that isn't all. Notice, in the verse, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen. Well, what is he and Barnabas going to go unto the heathen with? What are they going to take to the heathen? Oh, yeah, it's going to be the gospel of the uncircumcision. It's going to be the effectiveness of the apostle of the Gentiles. You mean Barnabas is going to preach the gospel of Christ? Yes. Do you get what I mean? The same kind of people that would argue whether or not salvation is always the same don't want Barnabas to be cut out of the kingdom of heaven. He wasn't cut out. God Almighty made a choice. God called him to do what he told, called him to do. And he was to go preach the gospel with Paul, just as he had been doing for those first 12 years. And he's to continue on. Isn't that fascinating? Yes, that's fascinating. I don't understand why a grace believer would believe that Barnabas was still in the kingdom of heaven. And I keep bringing this up, not because I want people to argue with me, but because I don't see any way to reason out any other way. I, you know, if I get there and I find out that Barnabas is down there in the city, I won't be angry. But he preached the gospel of Christ with Paul. How's he going to answer to the 12 apostles preaching the gospel of Christ to Paul, with Paul? The gospel of the circumcision and the gospel of the uncircumcision are not the same thing. And you can't make them be the same. And Barnabas is with Paul going to the Gentiles, taking the gospel of the uncircumcision. My, my, my. Now, all that being said, let's go back again to Acts chapter 20. Oh, I, I'm sorry. You need to hold on to Acts chapter 20 anyway, but I meant to go back to Philippians 4. Philippians 4. And verse 15. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. This is some five years or so after the Acts chapter 16, 15 departure from Jerusalem. And Barnabas did not go with Paul after Act, at the start of Acts chapter 16. He took Mark and went to Cyprus. And people like to make such a big deal out of that because they say, well, Mark wrote the book of Mark, and that's about the kingdom gospel. 
Well, yes, it was, but Mark was already done with that. And when you read 2 Timothy chapter 4, you find out that Mark was profitable in the ministry that Paul was leaving behind. You know why things change, folks? Because the Lord wants them to. You know why dispensations get settled? You know, imagine Abraham leaving Ur of the Chaldees. And who do you suppose he made happy because he chose to leave the Ur of the Chaldees? Do you, do you believe they gave him a parade and kicked him out of town with every, every kind of gift there was and lauded him with all? No way. You only need to know anything, about, something about the Ur of the Chaldees. If you just look up Ur of the Chaldees, you'll find out why nobody did that to Abraham when he left. Well, it's some time later before the Lord told him why he was going somewhere else and settled him into that uh, promised land. Isn't that amazing? The Lord didn't say, you go over there and I'm going to make that the promised land. He said, no, you go over to a land I've told you, I'm going to, I'm going to show you. All I'm trying to get you to see is a change in dispensations. When was they ever smooth? I mean, think of the flood. That changed the dispensation. That's pretty rough. Not only was the 100 years of Noah preaching about it, not, it was rain for 40 days and 40 nights, and then there's another 110 days that Noah and his family stayed on that ark. That sound like fun? No. Sound pretty smelly? Yep. Ain't that something? Changing dispensations is not an easy thing to do. So, Joshua and Caleb bring the children of Israel into the land after Moses dies, and they begin to take over the land, and they wound up having to kick out a few, and they wound up getting a little a bit of idolatry mixed up with them, and, they, and so they lost a battle or two, and, and on and on it goes, and it's a, quite a while. I think it was about 70 years before all that got settled down. And then the judges reigned. See, the reason I know it's more than 40 is because Joshua didn't give them peace. But nevertheless, then the judges reigned, and all of a sudden the judges weren't good enough for them, so it took 40 years to get rid of a bad king and get a good king between King Saul and King David. It takes a while to get a dispensation changed, does it not? Jesus Christ was born and never said a word about his ministry for 30 years. It takes a while to change dispensations. Peter, James, and John, the 12 the rest of the apostles, went on doing whatever they were doing as far as you know, and you got no reason to suspect that they didn't since the Lord said they were all saved. And then they died. Paul got saved in Acts chapter 9, had a squabble in Acts chapter 9, got a ministry started in Acts chapter 11, but went out to do the work he was called unto in chapter 13. You realize that's over four years? I don't know how much over four years, but it's over four years. Takes a while to change the dispensation. And then from Acts chapter 20 to Acts chapter 28, another four or five years, Slight dispensation change. People don't like to hear that either. But there was. So what are we doing? We're trying to see how the Lord did it and why. And we're still not getting very far. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm just slow at it. But listen, folks, the detail of some of this will play, will play big in your mind if you hold the detail of it. Like the thing about Philippi. He said, at the beginning of the gospel, you were the only one gave to me. And he couldn't have been talking about 9 or 11 or 13 or even 16, because that wasn't the beginning of the gospel. But there was the beginning of something different when he said, you know, you're the only ones from the, from the beginning of the gospel or in the beginning of the gospel, you supplied my need. Now, Acts chapter 20. Verse 17. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, and he begins to talk to them here, and I'm going to take some 
time here, so stay with me. Uh, he's, he beginning, he's beginning to talk to them about their, their issues. That he has to that he has to tell them about this. He can't he cannot go on without telling them this issue, and it's their issue. It is not that they've done anything wrong, but he has to tell them things are not going to remain exactly as they were. And so when he does that, these guys are, if you might recall, in Acts chapter 20. These uh, elders from, from Ephesus, they're dead. They're not here anymore. You and I are here, and we've got Acts chapter 20. We need to pay attention. And other people who know the gospel of Christ as the power of God unto salvation, they need to know what's going on in Acts chapter 20. You know, it was a book written in Acts chapter 20, the book of Romans, wherein he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Well, he doesn't let up on that Jew first and also to the Greek all the way through the book of Acts. He just doesn't. Because now, as he says in verse 22, I'm going to Jerusalem. Read with me from verse 18. You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after, and that would be Acts chapter 18, after what, manner I, <clears throat> after what manner I've been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testi testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. There they are, Jews, Greeks. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, just so you can settle down all your Baptist friends, repentance toward God is not repentance for your sins. Repentance toward God is it means that you turn your mind into seeing God in the manner God wants to be seen. Repentance toward God. You change your mind and you look at God the way God wants you to look at Him. Okay? Verse 22, And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Oh, hmm. to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He had been preaching the gospel of Christ for lo these 20 years plus. Now he says he's going, to, he's going to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now a lot of people think there's no difference. There isn't any difference in the content of the gospel words. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. In Romans 4, he was delivered for our offenses, and he was raised again for our justification. In 2 Timothy 2, he was made for us a ransom for all. Now those words are, the context of those words is all the same. But he called it the gospel of Christ, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of Christ. But then he said, it's the gospel of the grace of God. And no one had heard the gospel of the grace of God, though they had heard the gospel of Christ. You say, well, how's that possible? Because of where it was going and to whom it was going. Just to let that sink in. Everywhere he's been, up to Acts 20, he first went into a synagogue and he found Jews who had the scriptures 
and he found Jews that he could tell the gospel of Christ unto. And he was not ashamed of it, and he preached it gloriously. And thousands, no doubt, were saved by the gospel of Christ. You and I were saved by the exact same words, but it's known in Scripture as the gospel of the grace of God. So the first time somebody questioned me about that, they began to build an argument on the basis that I was saying that Paul was not saved by grace, nor any of his first 20 years plus worth of preaching that he didn't preach salvation was by grace. That's not true. I never said it wasn't by grace. Romans chapter 3, 4, and 11 will prove that it was salvation by grace, as does Galatians 3 and a couple of places in 2 Corinthians. I'm not saying it wasn't salvation by grace. I'm saying it wasn't by the gospel of the grace of God. There's probably not 1% of so-called grace believers that care about this, really. And it's all right with me if you don't care about it. But never, ever confuse the terminology of telling, letting the terminology tell you what the terminology tells you. Don't mix that up. Don't make that more difficult than it is. Leave it just as simply as the Lord put it. He was going to go to testify the gospel of the grace of God, not to testify unto the gospel of the grace of God. He was going to go testify the gospel of the grace of God. Nobody had ever heard it. Well, let me remind you of a couple of things. Paul, even though he's leaving these people, he is intent. He knows he must go back to Jerusalem. He started in Acts chapter uh, 19 when it was obvious he was being run out of Ephesus, making his plans to go to Jerusalem. So here he is. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He says that. He says, but now I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem. What's the point of going to Jerusalem? His point in going to Jerusalem is to take that gift to them. His plan after that is to turn right around and go to Spain. Do you ever wonder why Spain was mentioned there in Romans 15? Talk about a land of the Gentiles. Talk about a land that needed the missionary of the gospel, the grace of God. He was going to Rome, the center of all horrific things about government, and Spain. I have no idea where else he thought he might go, but he was going. It was his plan. So, first you go to Jerusalem, and you take the gift. Now, we're not done in Acts 21. There's too much in the context. context. But look in Acts chapter 21. Look at verse um, 10. They're on their way, him and his company, whoever it all it is, a bunch of them, they're on their way to Jerusalem. Verse 10. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle, which a belt, and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem Bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Hmm. That's quite a prophecy. Don't sound too good for Paul, does it? No, doesn't. Look what happens. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him, Paul, not to go up to Jerusalem. They don't want him to go. Why? Because it's been prophesied that he's going to be bound hand and foot and given, given over to Gentiles. Wow. 
I'm not sure I'd have gone. I just said, you know, well, maybe you're right. How about you guys taking this gift up there to Jerusalem? I don't know what I would have done. Praise the Lord. He didn't call me to be an apostle. He called me to tell you what's in here. <laughs> so look at verse 13, what Paul says. Then Paul answered, what mean you to weep and to break mine heart? For I'm ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. He's going to go anyway. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. And after those days, we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Manasin of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. And when we were come together, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. Do not miss that last phrase. In 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter calls himself an elder. And verse 18 right there said, and we went in unto James, and then it says, and all the elders were present. You know how many all is? You're right. It's all of them. And so they're there. Peter's there. James, the brother of Jesus, half-brother of Jesus is there. All the other uh, uh, ten are there. Right down to Matthias. They were there. They were all there is what it said. Verse 19. And when he had saluted them, he declared, Paul declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Now, lots of people like to split these into good Jews and bad Jews. I see no point in that. I really don't. My opinion about who does what to whom here should just be my opinion. But it was the Jews who were zealous of the law, verse 21. And they are informed of thee, that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take, and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they, they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood and from things strang and from strangled and from fornication. Then Paul took them in, and the next day purifying himself with them entered into the temple to signify, the, to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. Now, here's the deal. Why did Paul do that? People all the time want to know, why did Paul do that? Where was Paul when he did this? He was in Jerusalem. Who was he paying attention to? He was paying attention to the Jews who were gathered together, all zealous of the law, but they were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul went in unto them and told them how that what God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. He wasn't talking to a bunch of strangers. He's talking to James, the Lord's half-brother, and all the elders and whoever else was there. Now, there are people that say, well, number one, Paul shouldn't have been there. Well, we've already gone over that part of it. Others say, James was out of the will of God. Well, I don't see any point in doing that. It isn't a matter of whether they were good, good Jews or bad Jews. They were present with the elders, and that's the apostles. It's not your responsibility to decide whether they were good Jews or bad Jews. It is your responsibility to take note about what happened. So they come out. They get this uh, offering made for them, and they, the, him and these men, they come out of the temple. Verse 27. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. 
Now you want to find some bad Jews? That'd be a place to find bad Jews right there. Crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, which he never did. Go back through it and see if you can find where he ever did. He didn't. And further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. For they had seen him, they had seen before with him in the city, Trophimus and Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. No, he went into the temple with these four men who were trying to be purifying themselves in the temple. They would have been Jews. Uh, verse 30. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came in unto the chief priest, uh, chief captain of the band, and all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. Agabus was right. He said, "This they're going to bind his hands and feet. The man who owns this girdle is going to bind his hands and feet and turn him over to the Gentiles. They just did it. They just did it. How fascinating. So he's turned over to the Gentiles. And that part doesn't change the rest of his life, or the, the rest of the book of Acts. Look, if you will, in chapter 23, and let's see what the Lord thought of this. He's in a prison, in a castle. I don't know what all that means. Verse 11. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Let me show you what the Lord did not say. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Good grief, Paul. You got yourself in such a mess. Am I going to have to get you out of this one too? He didn't say that. He said, Be of good cheer, Paul. Things are okay. The Lord said, Be of good cheer, Paul. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, we'll get back to that next week, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. He's going to get to go to Rome. The Lord doesn't tell him how any of that's going to work. Just that he's going to get to go to Rome. As thou hast testified to me here at Jerusalem, so must thou also testify, uh, bear witness also at Rome. Ain't that something? And the answer is, yes, that's really something. Now, the first thing that happened was that the Jews compelled him to follow the rituals carried out in the temple, and he did. People say, well, he was wrong. No, he wasn't wrong. If he was wrong, the elders would have spoken up. After all, tell me this. The elders, which are the apostles, in Acts chapter 3, where did Peter and John go in order to serve the Jews? They went to the temple. Yeah, they met other places. Yes, they had their company all put together in two or three different uh, uh, times in the book of Acts. You can see that they're, they're there, but they're not in the temple. But they were in the temple in chapter 3, and bless your soul, they were in the temple in Acts chapter 21. Not where they met, but they were associated with the temple in Acts 21. And all the elders being present would have been in on that decision. And if you think that's not possible, then why in the world would the Lord have stuck and all the elders were present with James in verse 18? The Lord wouldn't have done that if the elders hadn't been involved in the whole deal. So well, what, what good would it do then? They knew that there was nothing of the temple. They were waiting for the seven-year tribulation to start, don't you know? They're waiting for the time when Israel was going to be restored. 
uh, Jerusalem, I'm sorry, when Jerusalem was going to be restored. They weren't waiting around so they could get caught in there and have to uh, stand, uh, withstand all those years with no food and water. and all. They weren't standing around in there for that. They were standing around in there waiting for the seven-year tribulation to begin, and they looked for that signal where they knew why the, how it would begin, and it never came, and it never came, and it never came, and boom, Titus and the Roman army shows up a little bit later, won't let them out of city. I know that's not in the Bible, but it's in the history books. Nevertheless, the 12 apostles weren't doing anything wrong when they told Paul, take this vow. Go in unto these men. There wasn't anything wrong there. You can't make Paul out to be a goat when he ain't no goat. Paul did exactly what the Lord wanted him to do. And he did it well. And the Lord never rebuked anything that he did. Ever. Kind of like Abraham. People say, well, Abraham shouldn't have lied about his wife. That's weakness in the flesh. Oh, I don't know so much about that. Did you ever see where the Lord rebuked him for it? No. Well, if the Lord didn't rebuke him, don't you either. It would not be a good thing for you to rebuke Abraham or the 12 apostles or Paul. All right. Now, back in Acts chapter 21, And there's one more point about what Paul did here in going into that temple. Look, if, if you will, down to verse, uh, uh, and remember, it's the um, elders, James and the elders, in verse 18. And verse 20 says, when they heard what Paul had to say, they glorified the Lord. And then in verse 21, they are informed, uh, no, I'm sorry, that's, that's, that's one of them talking. Let's see. Uh, Verse 20, uh, 23, do, there, do therefore this that we say to thee. Who is that? That would be James and all the elders. They are the they of the passage. And they told Paul, do therefore this that we say to thee. And they tell him how to do it. So he did it. And... Coming out of that temple is when all the upheaval began, and he gets thrown into the prison. Now, again, uh, this chief captain has saved him from the crowd, but he's put him in chains. Uh, verse 35, and when he came upon the stair, he commanded him, the, uh, verse 34, last part of verse 34, when he could not know the certainty of the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when, the, and when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born... Paul was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people that picked him up, put him in a, you know, between them, I suppose. For the multitude of the people followed after crying away with him. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, may I speak unto thee, who said, canst thou speak Greek? Art not thou that Egyptian which before these days made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness 4,000 men that were murderers? That's another long story. We'll take that up at another time. But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence, and he saith. And so he begins in verse 3. His speech right here is a great speech. It is a marvelous explanation of what he came there to do. What he came to Jerusalem to do was to testify the gospel of the grace of God, and he does it in that speech. Now, we're going to go over this next week, 
and we're going to go we're going to go back and forth in some of the things that Paul wrote to see if we can know for a certainty the difference between the gospel of Christ as the power of God unto salvation and the gospel of the grace of God as it was told in Acts chapter 22. Okay? I thank you for being here tonight. I hope it's not been too helter-skelter or out of whatever. And I hope that you've in, enjoyed it. And it will be, uh, for those of you who uh, know someone who might want to watch it, it'll be on the YouTube channel, Brother Jerry Lockhart. Uh, either later tonight or first thing in the morning, and it'll be there for you to watch again or to tell somebody about if you want to. Thank you, and good night to all of you.